Yes, I'm still here, Hollywood. And coming up on today's episode... He was not a good human. We would come to a wardrobe fitting at a new season to get new uniforms and new evening gowns and new loungewear. And he would call the wardrobe department and tell them to buy everything one or two sizes smaller than we are so that we would come in and be embarrassed in fittings and things not fitting. Here's one of my favorites, Debbie Allen, who was uh, so great to me. We were in Egypt to go to see the pyramids at Giza. All of a sudden we see a guy with a machine gun pointed at us. Least favorite? Tommy Smothers, oh. who asked me to look for a roll of quarters in his pocket. If you look back at television history, growing up as a teenager on a TV comedy has sometimes meant that there could be rough seas ahead as the actor grows up. But one young child star rode the wave of success as she cruised into adulthood. This is Still Here Hollywood. I'm Steve Kometko. Join me with today's guest, Jill Whelan from The Love Boat. You're like the patron saint of cruises right now, aren't you? <laughs> I am. I am. Only for princess cruises. How many cruises have you taken? Gosh, uh, I would venture to say, I don't know, six, 60, 70, maybe. Really? Yeah, probably. Somewhere around there. I don't know. I, have, I should really count, but I think I'm going to forget a few, like boyfriends. <laughs> oh, yeah, I've done that, too. Yeah, well, <laughs> um, fingers, toes, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Did you ever get seasick? No, uh, never on a cruise ship. I got seasick on, on like, a little fishing trawler. When, that doesn't count. Yeah, okay, good. Then no. <laughs> okay. Uh, do you miss Love Boat? You know, I miss, I miss the camaraderie. I miss the fellowship. Um, I miss the paycheck. But um, I, I think that's it, because the people, we were so, so close. As a matter of fact, I, three weeks ago, just got back from doing a play with Fred Grandy, who played Gopher, and Ted Lange, who played Isaac. We did a play in Michigan together, and it was at this beautiful little theater. It's in a town called Dexter, Michigan, and uh, it, it, the theater was just the sweetest little theater. It's called the Encore Musical Theater. The play was I'm Not Rappaport. Oh, yeah. Which, if people don't know, it's a beautiful story about how it feels to get old and to start to feel, you know, insignificant and uh, passed over. And there's this beautiful speech in there, which you're probably going to cut all this out because I'm going on and on. But this is me, tangential me. Um, the, the speech says, people collect old furniture, old movies, and old antiques, but they don't want anything to do with old people. The end of life is precious. It's just as precious as the beginning of, the, of life. And to forget about an old person, that's a sin. It's a sin against life. It's abortion at the other end. That's a good line. It's a great, it's a great monologue. It's a the great monologue. The thing is, I saw I'm Not Rappaport in Chicago. I believe with Judd Hirsch. Oh, wow. Okay. And um, I don't remember any young women being in it. So there are two. Um, oh, well, <laughs> thank you for saying the young part. Um, one, my character, Clara, plays the daughter of Fred's character and Fred Nate. Uh, and his character is in his 80s. When Judd Hirsch did it, he was in his 40s. Fred is now in his 70s. So it was pretty cool that Fred did this so well um and she's supposed to be in her 40s so I'll, I'll i'll take in my 40s okay i'll take that but uh there's another girl who's much younger who uh has one little scene in it where there's a cowboy who comes in and kind of attacks her but the point to get it bring it back is that uh we did this play together in this little theater and they had an actor's house that we lived in together the three of us wow. for a month and it was such a pleasure, such a joy to hang out with my pals. It's the first time we've three worked together since the show, and it was awesome, awesome. How old were you when the show started or when you first became a cast member? I was, I think, I think 11. Um, I think I had just turned 11 or I was about to turn 11 when it started. Uh, do you have fond memories of it? I do. I have great fond memories of my cast and our crew. Uh, and Aaron Spelling, 
not so fond memories of Doug Kramer, however, because Doug was a misogynist. And um, I, I've never talked about it, but he's passed now and his children are passed as well. So I feel safe in saying, but he was not an advocate of women at all. The late Douglas Kramer was the producer of The Love Boat. He, he had a reputation of being kind of tough as well. He was, um, he was not a good human. He would do things like um, when we would come, Lauren Tweez, who played Julie McCoy, uh, we would come to a wardrobe fitting at a new season to get new uniforms and new evening gowns and new loungewear. And he would call the wardrobe department and tell them to buy everything one or two sizes smaller than we are so that we would come in and be embarrassed in fittings and things not fitting. Um, and I remember one time, and at that, I mean, at that particular time, I was going through puber puberty and it's, you know, things happen in puberty. Uh, so, um, I had gone to a, a fat farm, or I guess we would say today a spa. I went to a spa uh, in Ojai, and I had lost some weight. And I was also working with some crazy doctor who had me on 400 calories a day. Oh, no. Yes, so I came That's back. That's too drastic. It's, it's, it screws with your metabolism and everything. Um, I got the cover of the Inquirer for it, but... Uh, I came back and I just learned this information from a dear friend of mine who was his executive assistant. She said we were in dailies one day, and for people who need to know what that is, once you shoot a day of, at least in film, um, on a set, the next day the editor prepares everything, all the takes and everything that the director has said print to, and the, the producers and the director and everybody that needs to watches it on a big screen. And there's a scene where I come out of an elevator and the doors open into the purser's lobby and I'm in an evening gown with a sweetheart neckline. And she said, you looked great. You looked great. And it was a full shot, full body shot. And Doug said, uh, no, I don't want that shot. I don't want to see her looking thin. I'm pissed off she was fat in the first place. Neck up only. <laughs> well, thank you very much. So um, to your question, the cast, the crew, I had no problem with, with anybody I had an incredible experience, except for the Doug Kramer part, which did require a lot of therapy afterwards. I had a uh, run-in with the National Enquirer, but it was a good one. Oh, that's good. It's when I was dating Greg Nuganis. Oh, Greg. And it said, uh, the headline was, Diver Flips for 37-Year-Old TV Hunk. <laughs> I love that. At the time, I wasn't 37. <laughs> And it made me younger than Greg, which he wasn't too happy about, but well, I didn't listen, care. Listen, I mean, you know, yes. take the win. Right. <laughs> um, a lot of famous faces and names came through the love boat, mm. took a cruise on the love Over boat. Over a thousand. Do you have uh, fond memories of anyone in particular? Oh, gosh, I have so many fond memories of so many Give us a good people. story. Just pick one. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay, here's one of my favorites, Debbie Allen who was uh, so great to me. Uh, she, when we were on, I think she did two cruises. And one of the cruises, we happened to be in the North Sea. So we had our own kind of little ship and nobody else was on it but us. I think it was something called the Stella Maris or something. And we would go in the middle of the night to the kitchen and we would raid the kitchen together. And then she would give me and my best friend dance classes. But on another cruise, we were in Egypt and we had a day off. So when you get to the port of Alexandria, you get off the, I think it's Alexandria, mm -hmm. that makes sense, uh, to go to see the pyramids at Giza. So you take a bus, a coach, all the way to the pyramids, and we were at the pyramids, and it was many, 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 many years ago. And there was a cyclone, cyclone fence around the Sphinx, but it was open. So Debbie and I we're like, okay, we have to get back to the bus, but let's just go, let's just go look. My mom had already gone back to the bus and everybody was back. So we get in there and we're looking around. All of a sudden we see a guy with a machine gun pointed at us, uh, you know, a soldier, not one of our soldiers. And he doesn't speak English. We obviously don't speak his language at all. And we could understand that he wanted money from us to get out. Debbie turned into mama bear with the finger snapping, the neck pulling... And she's got me behind her and she's backing out. My mother, I can see her probably a mile away going, 
joke. She doesn't know what's happening. She's just pissed because I'm not on the bus. And Debbie got us out of there and we tore back to that bus. So that's one fun story. I mean, that there's, fun. yeah, there's so many. Shelly Winters was an exhibitionist and on the cruise ship, we had a makeup room that for some odd reason had a bathtub in it and she decided to use it. So there's that fun. Um, Boy, my mind's eye is just going crazy. I know, you can't unsee that, I know, <laughs> I know. So that that was a fun, um, the, God, there's just, there's so many of them. Back to Ethel and uh, Carol Channing on one of our musicals. Carol was a very um, peculiar gal, as, as you know. She had lots of things that were interesting. She'd carry her own food around with her everywhere. I remember being in Chasen's and she'd walk in with her Tiffany camping gear that had her own distilled water and her own food. But on this particular occasion, uh, they had honey wagons on the, because there were so many stars there, Cab Calloway, Ann Miller, um, on and on, uh, Van, um, uh, Van Johnson plus Carol and Ethel. Uh, so honey wagons are like miniature uh, trailers uh, for people who don't know. It's a very small little room with a bathroom and a dressing table, and that's where Carol was that's where her trailer was and they couldn't find her one day on the set and they were looking everywhere where is Carol where is she everybody's going crazy because it's a huge production they finally found her sleeping underneath the honey wagon on the asphalt because <laughs> it was too hot in her trailer so rather than come and ask somebody to she help her turn the shade. she slept in the shade under the trailer on the asphalt so mm. so those are some fun stories I have she was such a character. She Carol really Channing. was. She really was. Um, least favorite? Um, I have two. Buddy Hackett is one. He was just difficult. Um, and the other one was uh, Tommy Smothers, oh. who asked me to look for a roll of quarters in his pocket. Did you find them? <laughs> I, you know what? I had my own quarters. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I, I think he was in trouble with the law later. There are some stories about him uh. with young children. No wonder his mother always liked his brother better. <laughs> <laughs> well played. <laughs> <laughs> um, really? That's interesting. Ah, yeah. Well, you know, they say comedians have a dark side. All comedians have a dark side. That's true. I mean... That makes sense. They say therapists go into therapy to solve their own history, and comedians probably do the same thing with being on stage. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, so tell me, what have you been doing? Well, let's see. Since Love Boat, uh, <coughs> I'll thumbnail that, because um, that's not very interesting. Um, I, When the show was over, I immediately went and did a, a TV movie that Martin Sheen directed, which was amazing, but then started feeling the pressure of being an actress after a series and it wasn't like today where there's that machine that just cranks it out cranks it out for these young kids and i i just was i wanted to do something else i i didn't like the pressure in la of you're only as good as your last gig so i decided to go to college and i did uh two semesters abroad in england at guilford university and I majored in English literature and then um, came back to L.A. and said, mm, I still don't like it. So I moved to New York. I knew one person and she worked at Madison Square Garden. And she said, if you really want to empower yourself, you should learn the other side of the business. You should know how to produce. OK. So I came in and I started working for her as a runner, producing concerts. And in the side time, I, I did a play at Naked Angels Theater and a couple of other little plays. Um, so I did that. And then I met my first future ex-husband, got married, came back to California, uh, got pregnant with my son, um, and just took a break from the business because I wanted to raise my kid. And uh, that marriage didn't go well, but I wouldn't trade it because I got my son and a lot of good hard life lessons I learned. Um, divorced him and needed to feed my kid. And it seemed too daunting to try to start over acting. So I started working in a newsroom. And I was um, a, a desk assistant first at the assignment desk. And then I became an assignment Which editor. Which uh, KCOP, the bastard children of news in Los Angeles. Isn't that uh, Channel 13? Yeah, yeah. Uh, they don't, I don't think they have a news 
station. But Lauren Sanchez, after Tawny Little, became our anchor. Mm. So, yes, there's a whole thing there. And um, then I left there and went over to Investigative. And uh, Lauren Sanchez of Jeff Bezos fame? Correct. Correct. Um, then I... Uh, had, I got re- I remarried a guy that I knew when I worked at Madison Square Garden, so I moved back to the East Coast with my son, and uh, got pregnant and had my second son, and so then I left uh, that husband after a while, so I came back to Los Angeles with my kids, and um, when my son was old enough to go to school, my youngest, and be in school for a f- couple of hours is when I decided to get back into the business and and that's what I did. And now I am, I've done a lot of episodic stuff, a couple of films, but I'm also producing. Um, I have some projects that I'm super excited about. Um, Derailed by the pandemic, right? Well, one of them, yeah, my scripted show was derailed uh, by the pandemic where it, at at the home where we thought it would be. Uh, But, you know, everything happens for a reason and I'm, I've been in this business long enough to know you just, it's a law of averages. You know, you just have to keep. Stick with it. Stick with it and yeah. push it and do persevere. it. Persevere. Persevere. That's, the, those are the people that make it um, in the long run. And then uh, my podcast that I've started with my pal, Leah Mangum, whose husband is a gentleman whose name is Jonathan Mangum. And Jonathan is not only an actor, but an incredibly talented improver. And he is Wayne Brady's partner on Let's Make a Deal and also on Whose Line Is It Anyway? And Leah is an accomplished actress writer as well. So she and I are starting this podcast called Empty Nesters because our youngest boys are graduating this year from high school and off to college. So it's most of the people that I know are in this boat. So it's kind of like, who are we if we're not? We wanted to call it Who the F Are We? But (laughs) Um, we decided Empty Nesters was a lot more palatable. So uh, she and I have been doing lots and lots of interviews, getting ready to launch our little podcast. Uh, and it's just about reinventing yourself. And who are you if you're not just the parent of your children? And and what can you do to fulfill your soul? And what is your second act? Um, so that's kind of what's happening right now. All of those things. And I'm married to my fabulous husband and... Third time's a charm. So they say. So they say. So that's kind of what's ha- that's what's happening. Well, that's good to know. Yeah. Your husband was a quarterback? Yeah. With the Denver Broncos? He was, but he'll he'll say, "Oh god, don't tell that story." Oh. Cuz he's fine. He um he was a very gifted athlete when he was a kid and he was all-American in basketball, baseball, and football. Um but really did it because he was good at it, not because he had a passion for it. And uh, he was he came up right before John Elway. And he was second string, I think, quarterback. And he just uh, he just kind of said, why am I getting hit all the time? This is, this is not... He came to his senses. <laughs> he did, before he had too many concussions. And um, he went into business. And so that's what he does now. He's, uh, he's in naming rights. So he negotiated and brokered the deal at Staples Center. For the name of Staples Center and uh, Kodak Theater, and then it was um, Dolby, and then Kodak again. So he—that's kind of what he does oh. now. Yeah. Uh, so a related business to yes. what you do. Yes. Um, are you able to look back now? You know, there's all those horror stories about kids. Yeah. Coming up through Hollywood, sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. Are you able to look back and say? You know, I was lucky, I was talented, I made it. Uh, I absolutely was lucky, but um, the luck is because of my mom. I'm still scared of her. (laughs) So she's the reason I haven't been arrested yet. Um, She was, and that's what I say, I used to uh, teach acting classes to kids when I lived back east. And the parents would always say to me, should I get my kid an agent? What do you think? I said, absolutely not, unless they get it themselves, which is possible because I did. If they're that driven, then you just have to be there to guide them. But the biggest problem that, that people have when they have a kid in our industry is that kid becomes their identity. 
and their representation of their own success. And they get mesmerized by the money and the power and the fame, and they forget their job is to be the parent. And my mom. It's like gypsy. It's like we were talking about gypsy. Yeah. And it, it is absolutely that. My mother, I remember on my first series, the first day we were on the set, this producer came up to me and said, Listen, or said to my mother, and I, she was holding my hand. She said, you know, if there's anybody on this set that Jill doesn't like, just let me know and we'll have them fired. And my mom started laughing and she went, <laughs> here's the thing. If you ever give my daughter that kind of power, we will be out of here before the ink on this contract <laughs> is dry. And that's how she was the, the entire way. She never forgot that her job was to be my mother, not my manager, not my agent, not my PR person, but the person who, I never knew how much money I made or any, any of that. I, I um, was in school every single day that I wasn't on the set. I was in the school plays. I was in the school <laughs> band, which is really hilarious since I don't play an instrument, but I was one of the marchy marchy girls with the thingamabob. So um, it's, she's, that's why I'm able to look back because I had a really grounded home situation. I read about Judy Garland calling her own mother the real wicked witch. Yeah. Just one of those stories. Yeah, it's, and there's many of them, and, and it's a shame because these children need guidance. I remember um, Danny from the Partridge family, Danny Bonaducci, uh, he was having an argument with his mother, and they lived in a house that he owned. And she said, you go to your room. And he said, which one? I own all of them. And if I had yeah, said that to my mother, <laughs> um, I'd be speaking to you with dentures. <laughs> so those are all your real teeth? Yeah. Well, they're veneers on top, but not because of my mother. <laughs> okay. You've done some reunion specials with the Love Boat folks. Is there any talk of doing any more? Uh, well, we're doing a reunion cruise, actually. Uh, which is coming up uh, Labor Day weekend, I think. But one of my projects, one of my scripted projects, is not necessarily a reboot, because I don't think you can properly reboot the show. Different time back then to now. It's, uh, but but uh, it's the closest you'd get to a reboot, and that's one of my projects. Can you sing the Love Boat theme? I can. Do you want me to? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Jill sings the Love Boat theme, but again, music costs money. She's got a terrific voice, though. Ta-da. Next. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I wasn't certain you'd be able to do it. I can. But it's one of those theme songs that yeah. everybody knows. Yeah, I had much. to sing it in my uh, one-woman show, so. We'll be back for more in a moment. Arnold Schwarzenegger cupped my ass at a Young Republicans dinner for George Bush. Debbie Reynolds used to get drunk and climb out of a piano on one of our cruises. What else did you do in your one-woman show? Um, I did, well, I did a really fun number uh, set to the tune of There's No Business Like Show Business. Uh, so I would sing the song, and then I would break right after the chorus and say, um, Arnold Schwarzenegger cupped my ass at a Young Republicans dinner for George Bush. Then I would go back to singing the song, and then I would uh, get to the next part and say, um, gosh, I'm trying to think of some of the other uh, uh, some of the other stories that were in there. Uh, Debbie Reynolds used to get drunk and climb out of a piano on one of our cruises. Um, <laughs> that's that's in there. Um, I would talk about in that song some of my uh, first on stage kisses. The first time I ever did get kissed was on camera. So from whom? I think it was my dear friend Glenn Scarpelli. Oh. I might have turned him gay. <laughs> Is you know, that blame or credit? I think both. <laughs> <laughs> I love his husband, so I'm going to take credit. Okay. <laughs> These were all little sto stories. Arnold, Arnold, Arnold. Arnold. Was it hard being the only kid on a set of adults? Um. I, I, I will give you the best answer I know how, which is that um, I don't know anything different because that was my only experience. It was that was my life. I will say 
it was frustrating when we would do cruises because I had to go to school. So when everybody else, I could look out my little porthole because back then it was before you could have balconies and things. Um, I would look through my porthole or I would look through a side window and I would see everybody at the pool and I was there with my math book. Mm. So that part was, that was hard, but you know, I mean, give me a break. I was on a cruise ship going to school. So when I was studying about the Great Wall of China, I was sitting on it. So, I mean, I don't feel that badly for myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if your children wanted to go into the business, what would you do? Well, my eldest is in the business, but not in front of the camera. I wish he was because he's actually really good. But I'm relieved he isn't because it ain't easy. Um, he's an editor and a director. My youngest um, wants to be a script writer for video games, but if they wanted to, I have a hair on the side of my face, that's fun. Um, it's if, not even a full moon. I know. <laughs> oh, that's good. Um, I mean, obviously I would support them because I don't want to be that parent who says, you're going to be a lawyer or, you know, um, if, if they wanted to do it, I would, I would definitely support them. But it would be hard because I have lots of friends who have kids who are actors and musical theater actors. And the calls I get from my friends are like, I can't believe you did this for a living. I don't, I can't stand this as the parent. I can't stand it. Because it's painful to watch your kids hear no, no, or see people objectify them in a way of too tall, too short, too thin, too fat, too old, too young. You know, as the person yourself, you, you get a thick skin. You, you deal with it and you know that it's the choice that you made but when it's your kid I know how I was on a soccer field if we had a bad ref probably wouldn't be a good thing for me <laughs> it's, it's it is kind of good to know those things though uh, thick skin is very comes in very handy in this city yeah I mean you know I don't have to tell you you know too it's uh it's, there's something you know about actors and people in our industry that, and it's a different climate now too, because it's not, it's not lovers of the industry for the most part that are running the industry anymore. And there's a lot of drawbacks that, you know, we as actors fought very hard for in this last strike with directors. Um, and there is an impersonal, this is not a word, but there is an impersonalness, it's my word, <laughs> And that 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 is attached to the industry that has always been there. That part has always been there. That, gosh, if I had a kid doing it, I I, I just don't know. And there's so, there are so many outlets now. So many outlets, which in a way is great because look, you can do this. I can create my own projects, and if they work, great. You know, but we are given opportunities that we didn't have before mm -hmm. in, in that regard. But there's there's it's, it's impossible to watch everything and consume everything as an actor, as a producer that you need to in order to be up on everything that's out there. You know, how does Taylor Swift do it? I don't know. But boy, she does it well. Yes. And she has a lot well. of eyeballs watching her. She does. And you know what? She deserves every one of them. I think I think Taylor Swift is a spectacular human being and kudos to her folks uh if you were to go back and choose someone who's no longer here uh who you wanted to work with or who you wish you could have seen oh my god um, i love that question who would it be or is there more than one? Oh, i'm sure there's more than one. Oh, i'm sure of it um Oh, God, I would have loved to have worked with Elizabeth Taylor. Um, a dear friend of mine uh, is in charge of her estate, and so I, I just hear such great stories, and um, I would have loved that. Who else would I would have loved? You know, I, even though there's terrible stories, I would have loved to have met Louis B. Mayer. Mm. I know there's terrible stories, but I still would have loved it. Um, Gosh, who else? Ann Miller was on the love boat once, she wasn't was. she? She was. And another great gal. Broad. Another great broad. She'd walk on and say, the old battle axe is here. 
and she was just cute as a button cute as a button i mean i was so lucky to work with so many lillian gish i got to work with lillian gish and um tom hanks andy warhol so that's a great andy warhol story is kind of a cool thing he um I was in New York one day shopping, and somebody tapped me on the shoulder and said, excuse me, are you Jill Whelan? I said, yes. She said, I work for Andy Warhol, and if he knew you were here, he would be very upset if I didn't invite you down to the factory. Are you doing anything right now? Uh, no. <laughs> not now I'm not. I mean, think about that. In today's world, if somebody tapped you on the shoulder and said, would you get into a cab with me? I don't know you. <laughs> I did. It explains both of my first two marriages, by the way. <laughs> um... But I did, and I went down, and Andy was there, and he could not have been more lovely. He signed posters for myself and for my brother, who's an artist, um, gave me a tour of the factory. I, I mean. If you're ever in Pittsburgh, go to his museum there. It's just terrific. I, w I will. It's I will. Great. It's okay. Right across from the stadium. Oh, okay. I didn't even know that. That's great to know. Oh, yeah. And I he's, will go. he's buried there in Pittsburgh. He's from there originally. Such a lovely human being. Yeah. Yeah, really sweet, really sweet. Good guy. I still, I can't believe Andy Warhol. Yeah. He did Love Boat. <laughs> well, it's kind of like John Waters, same kind of a yes. do things to experience them. That's right. Yes, yes. And we had Halston on. Wow. And Jeffrey Bean and Gloria Vanderbilt. <laughs> Anderson Cooper's mom. Yes. What a sweetheart. Yeah. I don't know him. I wish I did, but he seems like a fun guy to hang out with. Andy Cohen thinks so. <laughs> I, I know. On New Year's Eve. <laughs> well, we've all seen that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, what lies ahead for you? Gosh. Um, uh, so many things. I mean, these projects, which right. are going to be super, super fun. Um, I, you know, I take a day as it comes because I, you have plans, the best laid plans, but, um, what know. is it they say? Tell God your plans and he'll laugh at you. That's right. Something like that. My husband always, and my husband always says, you're just an idea factory because I have this, this, that, and the other thing. I've got a list of projects that I, that I want to do. Um, and you just, it's plate spinning so you whatever one is getting the most attention at the moment you got to deal with that one and then you move on to the next one uh so there's that but i also feel like you have to leave leave stuff open because opportunities can come and if you're too set in one direction you may miss the one that you weren't counting on but that the universe brought to you so there's that and what else is next spending time with my husband we've been married for seven years we found each other late. It's the third marriage for both of us. Um, I, I just, you know, I finally found the love of my life, and, and we just, we want to travel. We want to just be with each other and have fun and hang out with What's our friends. What's the old saying? You're going to do it again until you do it right. That's right. And I'm, my grandmother used to always say marriages are like pancakes. You have to throw the first one out. And she did. <laughs> oh, good for her. Yes. <laughs> if it wasn't working, good for her. Yes, yeah, she did. Um, she did. I was when you when you were saying earlier about uh, one of your husbands absconding with your money. I, I thought yeah. of Debbie Reynolds because that happened to her. I know. I think Liza Minnelli as well. Oh well. With David um, Guest. Thank you. Oh, it's like we're doing passwords. Hey. <laughs> Keep that in mind. Yes. Um, Liza, I love Liza, but. She's had some health issues lately, I yes. think. Yes. I, I know Liza. Oh, do you? Yeah. And, um, you know, God bless Michael Feinstein because Michael has been, uh, I'm very close with Michael and his husband. Um, Michael has been a blessing for her and protecting her and taking care of her. I've interviewed them both. You Liza have? was hysterical. Oh, God, yeah. she's so sweet. And quick. Oh, God, yes. I have on my phone... A message from her. We were at her house for uh, her birthday. Michael and Terrence threw a birthday party for her uh, at her beautiful townhome in L.A. And um, she called me. And I didn't, for some reason, I didn't know I had a message on my phone. So I didn't find it for like two or three days later. But it's the great, I still, I'll save it for the, for the rest of my life. Jill, 
It's Liza. Listen, I just love you. We've got to be friends. <laughs> Call me, would you, honey? Bye. Oh, my God, I love her so much. I mean, there's a woman who, boy, did she deserve every bit of accolade she's gotten for her career because she's got it. To just sit and listen to her sing a song is an absolute lesson in how to interpret. I've seen her in concert many times. Yeah. And I just... If for nothing else, I love the internet because you can dig up just about anything you want yes. and see it. Yeah. Whereas I remember as a kid growing up, if you saw a movie, you, you can't, you know, we didn't have VCRs. You couldn't get it on, you know. Netflix. Right. So my mother used to get really upset with me if I, when I did go to see, when they let me go see movies, if I wanted to see it again, you've seen it once. <laughs> yeah. Which does not work with me. It works with some people. It doesn't, sure, never worked with that me. Sure, that works with my husband, but not me. Oh, really? But don't don't you remember as a kid, at Christmas time, you would wait for Sound of Music to come on <laughs> because they always showed that and Wizard of Oz at Christmas. And I just, gosh, I I love that part of those halcyon days being kids that we, we don't have anymore. Right. I think the very first movie I ever saw was... Music Man. Really? Yeah. I love that you remember that. Oh, well. That you remember that that's your first movie. My dad movie. was a Baptist minister and movies were verboten. Ah. Uh, and I think I snuck away to see that one. Um, and then I got to interview Shirley Jones many oh. years later. Uh, and I, as a little boy, I fell in love with her because she was so good to Winthrop. She was. Played by R Ronnie Howard. Yes. Yeah. I loved doing, I did that musical. I played uh, Marion in that musical that was really really fun it's a good musical it's a great musical I saw it on Broadway with uh, Eric McCormick was in it when oh, I saw wow. it yeah he I love had, him too yes he he sat in that very chair and talked to us <gasps> he did yes I love him good guy yeah. really good guy yeah Canadian see <laughs> those Canadians I tell you they're the nicest people you're gonna have one here very soon am I Yes. Oh, Natasha. Natasha is another Canadian. Okay, that's a little sneak preview. Yes. Well, um, who is one of my good friends, and you're going to love her. You'll okay. love her. All right. Uh, I made a point of watching Species. Species? Species. I think it depends on whether you're Canadian or American. Oh, okay. Is that how you pronounce it? I don't know. <laughs> um, so it's fresh in my mind. I oh, good. talk to her about all kinds of things. Well, she's a world-class beauty also, so she's easy on the eyes. Yeah, she is beautiful. Yeah. Um, I think I'm done. All right. Jill. Well. Thanks for stopping by and warming our seat. Thank you for having me. Oh. <laughs> hey, it's nice being had. <laughs> Listen, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody still recognize you when you go out? Uh, out of yeah. curiosity? Yeah. Uh, funny enough, mostly on cruise ships, but... Um, you know, because they, they expect to see you there. Exactly. Exactly. But I just yesterday I was. Um, I went to the Pasadena uh, Showcase House where they, they do this fabulous thing and they decorate the houses and all the designers, different designers have a different room. And so I went yesterday and they, they have a little gift department, which I partook of. And when I gave the woman my credit card, she goes, I knew that was you. So sometimes. That's nice. Yeah. Yeah. It's very it's nice. It's nice to be thought of, remembered. You know, we are super, super lucky in that we, if I were on a soap opera or if I played a really, you know, not a nice person, I'm sure it would be like, I hate, but like a bitch, I'm sh I don't like you, you're a bitch. But because of the nature of our show, we were so lucky. My favorite comment that we ever get is, this was the only show that I could watch with my grandparents where we would both get something out of it and we could sit together for an hour and both be just as entertained. And that's my favorite. That's my favorite. Were you close with Gavin? Extremely. I, I eulogized him. Oh, did you? Yeah, along with his kids. And uh, he was very, very special. A dear, dear. Uh, just, I was very lucky to know him. He's a good guy. Okay. Thanks, Jill. You're welcome. Again. You're welcome. <laughs> Still Here Hollywood is a production of the Still Here Network. All things technical run by Justin Zangerly. Theme music by Brian Sanishin. And executive producer, 
is Jim Lichtenstein. <laughs>